My name is Helen He. I also work at the NERSC User Engagement Group. I am going to talk about running jobs of Corey. Here's a brief outline, a basic introductions, and then I'll give you some basic uh, batch script examples, and then um, introduce some more advanced workflow options. And then we'll talk about process thread affinity, especially on KNL, that is uh, complicated, and then how to monitor your jobs. So jobs at NERSC mostly are parallel jobs using from one node to thousands of nodes for capacity. And there are also lots of serial jobs, especially uh, from the uh, data, um, data intensive um, applications. Some of them, they can be just run, run as pleasantly parallel jobs or embarrassingly parallel or just run them in, ser in, in serial. We have uh, this type of mechanism to support these serial jobs here. And we have to run jobs in batch mode. So it's not like on your laptop, you, s you assume you submit a job and get result immediately. Jobs has to be set in the queue. Have we have to be fair that a job, a user so submit thousands of jobs and you some just job one job right after that, we should not allow the, the first thousand job to finish until your job would start. So we use a batch scheduler called Slurm. And we also support some type of interactive job that it, instead of sitting in the batch queue, you could also submit with um, jobs that we have reserved notes for them that you could watch and do um, debug um, some kind of interaction with your job in real time. So debug jobs are supported up to 30 minutes. There's also an interactive QoS supports up to four hours. Typical jobs is runs 10 and few hours to up to uh, maximum wall time we have. Some of the queue has uh, 48 to 72 hours. There are two types of logging uh, nodes on, on Cori, logging nodes and, and compute nodes. So logging nodes is Haswell, and there's also one type of compute nodes that's also Haswell, but there are a little bit different um, specifications of the logging node and, and Haswell uh, compute nodes. So logging nodes are especially for just editing and compile, submit batch jobs. Please do not run production jobs on the logging nodes, because it's a shared and you're gonna impact other jobs, uh, other users' responsiveness um, on, on the logging nodes. So compute nodes is where you um, execute your application. Most of the um, QoS uh, in the queue scheduler, uh, with, with the when we will get exclusive node allocation, so that you will be only user on those nodes and <coughs> and only this one uh, another type of QoS that allows shared nodes. So keep in mind that there are two types of um, compute nodes that. You could uh, optimize for each, as Genji um, mentioned, how to compile specifically so that your application would, um, would run um, optim <coughs> um, as a suitable for each type of nodes. Although has you binary beautiful Haswell do, do run on KNL, but not vice versa. To submit a batch job, you would have to prepare a batch script with some kind of directives that to specify what kind of resources you want, and then you would have to submit it uh, with a command as batch to the batch queue or as alloc to get into a um, interactive batch session. So here is how this should, would work. So you have a laptop on the logging node or when, when you log in query on the logging node, you would as batch or as alloc. And then after that, you would actually land on a head compute node, one of the compute nodes that's allocated to your job. And every single command in your batch script, not starting with SRAM, will run on this head compute node. Then in some, in some <coughs> period, you would, would submit an SRAM command, ask for multiple um, number of MPI tasks. At that point, your job will be allocated in parallel onto lots of uh, compute nodes that you ask for with number of n, little n in your SRAM command. I want to show you um, a illustration of a Haswell compute node here. And um, just to keep in mind some of these numbers here are very useful. Later on when you have to try to verify whether you're running optimally on the, the node. So Haswell node has two sockets and each socket has 16 physical cores. So numbered from zero to 15 on the top in one socket and in bottom it's started from 16 to 31. 
You would also notice some uh, green numbers here. For example, core 0 also has a core 32 there. So 0 and 32 are the logical core numbers that SLURM will recognize on the physical core 0. And 1 and 33 are the logical numbers, logical CPU numbers that actually stays on, uh, exist on the same physical core 1. The, there's also another, con another concept about NUMA node, NUMA domain. Um, so on Haswell, there are two NUMA domains. Um, <coughs> so within a NUMA domain, when a process has to ac access the memory, it's um, faster than it, have if ha it has to access memory on a far NUMA domain. So um, this is when we have to use you know, SROM options. We, should, we will keep that in mind, not to have um, memory access on the far NUMA domain. And there's ways to find out more details of a process compute node. Um, and like I said, if you want to find a compute node, you have to get onto the compute node first, first with s alloc command. I'm, I'm not giving the details right now, but I will we'll show this later. So this some kind of s alloc. And then when you get onto the head compute node, there are a few commands that you can run. NUMA CTL, hardware option, um, cat proc CPU info, hardware locality uh, data, and I'll give you a detailed list of you know, each processor, how many processors each socket, what are the CPU speed, the distances, all this kind of information. And KNL is a little bit more complicated. So we, here at NERSC, we basically set default KNL mode as quad cache. We being in, in quad mode, basically the, the, all, the one single uh, compute node is a one single NUMA domain. It has 68 physical cores, and each core has, two, uh, has four hyper threads. So again, look at these numbers and keep some of the numbers in, in your mind. For example, uh, core zero has logical CPU number zero, 68, 136, and two, two, uh, 204. Physical one, physical core one has logical cores one, 69, 137, 205. And uh, when we, again, later on, Wanted to remember 0 and 136 are on the same core, 1 and 137 on the same core. We'll show that numbers later. And cache mode meaning that um, on query there is a um, fast memory MCD RAM um, on the node. When it is, it can be set um, in quad mode, in cache mode or in um, <coughs> flat mode. But here, when it's set at quad mode, a uh, cache mode, and basically we have huge. Um, Num huge uh, size of cache that when your memory uh, application access memory is super fast then getting act on data on t uh, from the um, main memory right so that's the basic introductions and I'll show you the um, batch script examples and what are the key components in a batch script so here is an um, MPI example um, this slide just want to tell you that you have to give a shell um, to interpret, interpret all the commands you use in your batch script. Uh, dash, uh, bash, being bash is if you say I want the script to be interpreted as bash shell, and dash L is uh, as logging shell or not, that dash L is optional. And environment, before you submit batch script, it will be in, in, um, imported into your batch job. And second part of those things are what kind of QoS you want to submit to. So NERSC has regular, premium, low, all sort of those. Each uh, QoS have different type of limits and priority settings. And dash capital N, meaning you want four nodes. Dash T, meaning you want your max wartime job time to be uh, one, one hour. And dash C is a feature, so either Haswell or KNL. There are other more um, keywords. Dash L, dash, dash capital C is uh, required. Dash capital L and dash J are not required. Uh, dash L meaning what, what uh, file system your job uh, is required to use. So this helps um, that when in circumstances that say scratch file system has issues, when you, if you submit a specified dash L scratch, your job will be kept without starting so that it will prevent it being failed if style system has an issue that we, are know, of, we know of. Dash J would give your job a name. Um, <coughs> and also um, there are dash O, dash E to, to give a custom 
file name for your job output or a job error, etc. There are a lot more. And there's a dash E, um, dash M, like if you want to uh, receive an email from your job when it starts and finishes or fails. And here is um, num, uh, OMP num threads, those environment variables you want to set. We want to specify, um, try to emphasize, that if your job is pure MPI, if you never compiled with OpenMP or you don't use any threaded libraries, that's fine. But otherwise, we recommend to set OMP num threads equals one in just to prevent sometimes different compilers would use huge number of default number of threads that we are, you, you don't, it's not your intention to. Um, here's a, what is that? Where is the red thing here? Anyway, um, in this example, and here I want to just uh, talk about the SRAM command. So here, dash capital N40 is 40 nodes, and you see dash little n 120, 1280 means we're running with 32 MPI tasks per node. And dash C is what you want to give each MPI tasks per node, how many logical CPUs. So this is a Haswell example. We know that there's a total of 32 physical cores times two hyperthreads per core. There's a total of 64 logical cores on a Haswell node. If you want to use 32 MPI tasks on this node, you want to give two logical cores to each MPI task. That is dash C2 comes from. And then CPU bind equals calls, we learn, learn that it's especially in, um, important for um, Slurm, unless you're running fully occupied. As long as if it's not, without dash dash CPU bind option, um, the affinity, everything would be just a mess, completely mess. So we always tell you to use that. So here, um, just it basically follows this, the previous slide, but add more um, discussions here. So if in this, in, in this case, you, if you say, uh, I want to run 64 MPI tasks per node, it's like per um, CPU, logical CPU, per MPI task, one MPI task per logical CPU, at this point, you're using hyper-threading for the MPI tasks. Now the CPU bind has to set to threads in instead of cores because each MPI task has to bind on a thread, a hyper-thread. And then in, in this case, SRON-N 22560, meaning 64 MPI tasks per, per node, that's dash C becomes one. You give one C, uh, logical CPU per MPI task. <coughs> oh, I think this one comes from the this, this Zoom thing. Oh. It suddenly shows up. If I, let me see if I can, it's not on my slide, but yeah. <laughs> So we talked about uh, you could do um, hyper-threading with MPI as well. And now we are talking about real hybrid MPI, OpenMP um, batch script. So here we want you to say how many MPI threads you want set. And we also want to promote uh, OpenMP standard settings of proc bind and OMP places. It's very sensitive. So in this example, uh, we're, having, we're having four MPI tasks per node. And for the house world node, little dash C uh, would be 64 logical cores divided by uh, four MPI tasks, which is uh, dash C 16 here. And again, dash dash CPU bind equals cores. So, so always this little dash C number should be bigger than the number of open MP threads you would ask for. If you ask um, MP number threads bigger than that, you'll get a runtime error message about allocated resources not, um, you're, you're, um, not available for you. So I want to also just uh, talk about the serial jobs I mentioned. Um, a mechanism to do that is that we have actually a shared QoS, other than those regular law, et cetera. Shared QoS is exclusively, ex ex especially for those um, multiple applications to share a single node. So if it's a serial job, would you, you do not ask for dash capital N one node anymore. Instead, you would do little dash N, um, and default is one if you don't say it. Or you could say little n, some big number, if you want more memory. Even for your serial job, you would ask, you would get um, the equivalent of multiple, CP, multiple CPUs, a uh, memory worth of, um, on that shared node. Or you could ask for memory by dash dash mem option. By default, it's about a little bit less than two megabytes per um, little n. 
And since it's a serial job, we suggest you not to use SRAM because it adds extra overhead. And the shared QoS is only available on Haswell nodes, not on KNL. It is also possible to use the shared QoS to run small parallel jobs on it. And lots of details in this uh, on this the link um, provided here. Then I want to promote debug and interactive batch interactive jobs. For debug, you would say um, it's you could do such submit a debug job into batch uh, job script, or you could do it um, interactively with S alloc. So almost the similar the keywords here and you, that you use for S batch in your batch script here, and then. Once, uh, the, because they're reserved nodes, so it return time is relatively quicker. Then you, when you get an, a session, you're already on your um, head compute node. For interactive, it's especially highly recommended because it's either you get a node immediately within five minutes or you get, you're rejected, say, not enough nodes for you. So there are 192 nodes each on Haswell and on KNL nodes that you can ask for QoS equals interactive, and you get up to four hours and up to 64 nodes. There also, there's also a limit of 64 total combined Haswell and KNL for each repo. So if your colleagues are using this, you might not get nodes, <laughs> even there are um, free nodes available. Right? Any questions so far? Um, how can I run the ITAS array from the task array? What a task array? Yeah, ITAS array. Job array? Yeah. I'm gonna touch, this is the next topic. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> advanced workflow options. So here, bundle your jobs. This is a just a, a, a summary slide. I have one slide each for each of these topics. You can bundle job arrays, dependency, variable time, burst buffer, shifter, transfer, big mem. I'm not gonna go into detail what each for, but just to, let's talk about here each um, on each slide. Bundle jobs, meaning you want to run multiple S runs in one of your batch script. There are two ways to do that. You can run um, multiple jobs sequentially so on the left side. So sequentially means you run S run one after another. So here, what you want to have for the dash number, number of nodes is just the biggest number of nodes of your job when, uh, the, uh, from S run. But dash T for time, you have to ask the, com the summation of your S run for each, uh, for, for, the, for this big job. And on the right side is you want actually multiple S run job to run simultaneously. So what now you have to make, um, there's some, some blue things here. So first big capital nine number of no, um, node is now the summation of each node, uh, each S run. It's not the summation of little n add together divide by 32 or something because each S run has to be exclusively on a set of nodes. And then you also have to uh, put each S run into the background and add a wait at the end. Without doing that, your batch job was oh, exit prematurely. So the, the, the advantage of those bind, binding jo bundle jobs is that you may get your jobs, one single job, first easy to man ma manage maybe uh, in, instead of manage uh, lots and lots of jobs. Second, because there's some run limit, uh, submit limit, now it's this one, just one job, so your, your jobs you know, get to run without subject of the, the, those limits. And also, if you actually bundle big enough that you can get into the large job discount category. <laughs> right. right. Um, so job arrays. Job arrays is just to help you to manage many, many similar type of jobs. And the way to do that is by using one of the Slurm array job ID um, environment variable so that you can use that in your setup. Say, you know, CD test my job ID. And, and you can submit dash dash array one to 10, you're submitting 10 jobs. And each job will run, you know, to each, you know, each individual directory, for example. So, but in the number of jobs, submit limit, run limit, et cetera, each array job is actually treated uh, individually as one single job. You're not, you're not uh, overcoming the limits of that. And each array job is scheduled independently. Dependency jobs. So you may have some kind of workflow that one job depends on the output of the first job, whether the first job finishes or the first job is okay. So there are ways to set them dependency. Your first job get a job ID, 
and then you submit your second job, you say dependency is after OK, or first job, or after any, whether the first job is successful or not, <laughs> it means after any. And you could also do it in S batch script and dash D after OK. Two ways to do that. So you can chain your jobs. One thing to remember is that if the job is you know, dependent on another job while it's waiting in the queue, it is in the user held status, it does not accumulate a priority. Variable time jobs. Um, so what it does is, say your job needs um, a lot, a, a big number of um, hours that is actually over the maximum allowed limit of our queue limit. Our queue limit mostly is 48 hours. But I actually want to run this job for 96 hours. How can I do that? So this, you can use variable time jobs to do that by um, asking for time minimum and, and time and some kind of requeue signal, all these mechanisms built into it, which you, in your job needs to have the checkpoint restart capability. And by asking time min, it's variable time, it'll give you, um, when your job is in the queue, and um, scheduler will look into some kind of scheduling opportunities to give you job, um, get your job scheduled. You, can, you may get a work time anywhere between time min to min to time, which is like two hours to 48 hours in this example and around it, and you also give it, you know, how, how much time my job needs to have a um, little bit um, buffer that to actually, um, when job is not finished, right? Because I'm only getting this amount, it's not finished, I, give, I tell the scheduler that my job needs this much of time to do my checkpointing, okay? So it'll run into that checkpointing time is like, threshold is, is needed, it'll do checkpointing and exit, but then it's requeued automatically and I'll have to remember how much time your job have, has run already until all the way your um, accumulated runtime reaches your 96 hours, then this is your whole job. So this is useful that um, <coughs> you can get long time, war time. This is useful, you can get um, flexible war time that your job may get, get out in, into those uh, scheduling opportunities. And you may get better throughput. I think we have a requirement. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so here is the, when you use FlexQ, especially say, for example, there's like FlexQoS, the requirement is that you have, have, you have to have timing less than two hours, okay. and your max time is 48 hours. Oh, okay. But it's, again, it's the, to help you improve throughput. It also helps overall system utilization. Cause it, so if there are such jobs existing in the queue, if without the ti timing, they won't start. Now they can actually, uh, run, especially during a large maintenance or uh, some large job reservation, there are like draining hours, and those jobs can be, um, can, can, can fit in uh, per nicely. Also, the flex queue, and uh, beginning of the starting, I think April, is zero charge. Now we had, uh, still, you still have 75% of charging discount, which is great. It only exists on KNL. The burst buffer, um, so on, on the query, we have the um, high, <coughs> high bandwidth um, I.O. capability by using burst buffer. And you can request some kind of file system on the burst buffer. And then before your batch job, it's before it starts and after it ends, you can stage in and stage out your input and output directory and in files so that uh, during the runtime, you have much, much better um, I.O. performance. There's a, a, a detailed talk of burst buffer this afternoon for how to use this. And shifter. Some of the applications have their custom environment. They still want to run on a query. They want to bring in their own Docker image. And we can't, <coughs> so shifter is sort of a modified Docker image um, environment that you can run it on, on NERSC that you can upload your image. You build it on your laptop. You upload it to the NERSC shifter registry as a non-root. And, and runtime you can bring out uh, pull your images and onto computers and use your own custom environment. Again, there's also another shifter talk this afternoon for details. Transfer jobs. So we, um, <coughs> the, the, the um, high bandwidth, what's it called? The long-term high storage file system um, called HPSS. It's not a file system directly mounted on query, um, logging nodes or compute nodes, but but at runtime, if you want to get data um, onto 
uh, for usage for your batch job, and export is Q is exactly for this purpose. You can uh, you can stage data from HVSS before and after. If you do it inside your batch script, it'll cost you a lot because this is run actually on one node. If your batch job runs as for thousand nodes and inside it you get data from HSI, it, it costs you lots of allocation. So you want to do it separately. And export jobs actually runs on um, like s special logging nodes. So notice this batch capital M ES query is another batch uh, server, Slurm server, not the regular query. The regular dash M query, you don't have to specify it. But for Xfer, you have to say, I want to run on an um, ES query server. Big mem as well, there are uh, a few big memory nodes that you can ask for. There are also um, the special logging nodes. So again, dash M, ES query, and dash Q, big mem. You can ask for how much memory you want, and you can run um, <coughs> with and without S run, depending on what type of jobs are, your applications are. I, I, I put lots of links on each slide, so you can refer to it and look, look for more details later. Any questions so far? So um, about the job summation, even the job array, I just go to admin and it's uh, as batch and job name, that's it. Yes. I don't have to define like dash T or something. It's not like <coughs> So if your dash T is in your batch script, you don't have to. If not, you can add, add dash T in your S batch command line I as well at all. But the things inside batch script were overwrite. Over oh, okay. No, the other way around. <laughs> so process is read as memory affinity. What it does, process affinity is basically bind MPI tasks to CPUs, and thread affinity would bind threads to the, um, the <coughs> CPUs already allocated to the MPI process. So when you, when you bind those, it, you know, you don't want to be um, mindful about special NUMA domains. I do not want my, uh, and my open MP threads on a far NUMA domain, and I want my MPI tasks, how many, you know, if I say I'm on two socket on, on Haswell, if I run one MPI task on this, <coughs> on this um, Haswell node, and then I run 32 open MP threads, then there are some open MP threads you have to access memory on other one. So if you, for example, on those Haswell nodes would recommend at least two MPI tasks. And then each of 16 open MPI threads belong to one MPI task would be on the one single NUMA domain, something like that. So the goal is to um, use open MP standard so that there are open OMP proc bind, OMP places settings, so, and, and this is more uh, portable because these are standard. It, it's available for multiple compilers. There's a detailed page about jobs affinity. But just here, basically, we, what, what I want to try to tell you is that how important in your S run command with dash C and dash dash CPU, how those helps you to make sure your affinity settings are correct. And, and this I, I mentioned earlier, there's a NUMA CTL command uh, dash H to find out compute node information. So here's an example. On a 68 core KNL quad cache node, you get onto a um, compute node with s alloc dash qs interactive you land it on the a nid blah 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 it's a compute node name they all start with nid something and then you run this command and it gives you how many on this nid zero which is a knl node how many um, available one node means i have one numa domain one node means one numa domain and it gives you my all my logical cpu numbers zero to 271 which is six total number of 68 physical cores times four um, hardware thread. And it tells you my size, node zero, is actually memory size, 96 gigabytes per node. And if it's, because the, it's cache, and it, if it's flat, it'll actually give you my flat, uh, quad flat, uh, my flat on KNL memory mode is actually another NUMA domain. I'll tell you two NUMA domains if I'm, uh, I'm on a quad flat node. And I'll tell you the distance. Uh, this is because only one node, basically in the nodes from zero to zero is the same. If I have two nodes, it also says from node zero to node one is this distance. From node zero to node zero is distance. So to a node is a numa, numa domain. And the distance, if there are two um, numa domains, you'll get that the from local to far is, uh, is, is higher. So here is an example I'm just saying without dash C, dash CPU, even though I'm setting OMP number threads, proc bind, everything. Um, when I run this, my 
application with just say I want MPI, 16 MPI tasks on this node. What I get is here, my rank zero, um, threat zero, my rank one and threat zero, they actually landed on the same physical core, which is totally bad. <laughs> so what we do is we add these two. Here, uh, 16 MPI tasks on the um, KNL node. So we, because it's the reason is because 6 to 8 is not divisible by number of MPI tasks, 16. So we usually, on purposely, just waste four extra nodes, uh, cores on the KNL nodes. Just treat it as 64 um, no cores on the KNL nodes. Then there are 256 total logical cores here, divided by number of MPI tasks per node. In this example, it's 16. So we get dash C is also 16. With that, um, you now see rank zero, threat zero, and rank zero, threat one. Remember, I asked you to remember zero and 136 are the same, <laughs> on the same physical core zero. And one and 37, they're both on the physical core one. This is the final layout with the dash C and dash dash CPU bind options. And with 16 MPI tasks, you could get, I use, I use color, color um, diagram. So uh, for MPI rank zero, there are eight CP, uh, open MP threads that landed on four physical cores. And, and um, two of the threads would be on the same core, two of the threads on the same core. And then the rank one would be on these four cores, rank two. So it's long, now it's pretty um, neat. So this is just a, a method that we all please always do dash C and find out what dash C number should be, which is number of logical cores per MPI tasks on each node. So this is just a repeat. <coughs> The settings OMP proc bind, we ask you to um, recommend to use true. It, it's good for multiple compilers here. And OMP press places usually substitute threads. So here's an illustration on, one, um, on two compute nodes, KNL nodes, with 64 MPI tasks per node. By setting OMP number threads equals four, the dash C and dash U CPU bind are the correct settings. So here, without OMP proc bind and OMP um, places, the four threads are freely to uh, migrate within the core. So with dash and um, 64 MPI tasks, dash C4, you're giving four logical cores per rank. So each rank will be on each physical core. And then the four threads are freely migrate within the physical core. So next uh, plot is now I set proc bind equals true and places equals threads. At this point, each rank is still on each physical core, but now each open and piece threads is binding to each logical core as well. <coughs> there are some ways we have provided you to verify whether you're um, binding applications correctly. So we have a pre-compiled binaries um, check MPI in, uh, with Intel compiler on query. There's dot query because we used to have a dot Edison as well. <laughs> and check um, hybrid and Intel query. So, <coughs> so basically what it does is if your application has s run command, something, all the way settings everywhere, and then you just replace your application with check MPI and to figure out whether your binding is correct before you actually run your application. And now you have to actually to understand what these numbers are. These are the logical numberings, as I've shown in some of the terms. So you will see, hey, whether my rank zero, my rank one on these logical cores make sense, whether they are um, you know, across tiles, across multiple cores, or they actually they're not stepping on each other. These are the numbers to, to check if your affinity is correct. And in OpenMP 5.0, we have introduced something called OMP display affinity feature. You can set it to true. And with uh, given an affinity format, custom format, uh, it exists already. The OpenMP5, the whole thing is not available yet in most of the com um, compilers, but this feature is already existing um, in some of these um, compiler versions. So you set to true, and this is the format. You say, I want to have host information, process ID information, what, what my thread number is, and what my thread affinity is. 
and these host equals something, all these things are custom strings that you can put into. And while just by setting these two and when you run your application, you get those reports. It can also help you to check. Before that OpenMP uh, feature, there were like custom different compilers of their own settings, but it's not um, standardized. So this is more um, portable. Finally, I want to introduce you um, the JavaScript. JavaScript generator feature, it exists on my.nurse.gov. So here you go down, um, there's a jobs, and then JavaScript generator. So you can choose which machine and what my application, how many number of nodes, et cetera, and it'll generate, give you a template you can modify based on that. So last uh, section is about monitoring your jobs. So basically, it's in the queue, and then you would we, we talked about queue prior the job, when the job is going to run. It depends on the combination of which QoS you submit to <coughs> and whether you ask for a bigger job, a uh, small wall time, or a small job, long wall time. <laughs> the wait time is different. And this is SQS, and SQ uh, helps you to check what, what, what it, where your job is. So there's, um, I talked about SBatch, SALloc, SRAM, SCANCEL can delete your job. SQS and SQ can display your job in the queue with some priority information. Um, there are a few of others. I also have some slides on some of these commands, so I will just show the slides briefly. So SQS is a custom nurse custom batch queue script, so it's uh, formatted. And when you dash u, your username, or without dash u username, this by default shows your own. Dash a shows everybody's. There's some other options to show or not show some certain QoS, like do not show running jobs, show running jobs. There's a wide options, many other options. But the, the standard brief without doing any flags is basically gives you uh, one, one column that's not um, available in SQ. It's basically, it calculates your job priority and ca compares again the threshold priority that the hour scheduler is configured to, whether to start scheduling your job or not. So it's by pure priority scheduling, and I'll tell you your job scheduled start is you know within in, in 1.2 days, something like that. That means in 1.2 days, your job will accumulate a priority enough to be for the con scheduler to consider your job to start. Doesn't mean your job will start at that time. Only when your job will be able to be scheduled. So your job may start a few days later than that. So we have a note actually tried to clarify people would think, oh, that means my job was going to start really soon. It's not. <laughs> it's, but again, this job actually can start really soon if your job fits in the hole we call, we call backfill opportunities. So if your job, start your job, won't affect the next highest priority job in the queue, because it's, it's that job is a huge job, and schedule has to accumulate lots of nodes for that one. And it has already got some nodes, but then I, it can't start that job. But if your job uses that nodes and can finish before the next job actually can start, your job is backfilled, so your job may backfill. The smaller, the shorter job is has a higher chance to backfill. Okay. So that's SQS, and there's SInfo. It was some kind of format. It tells you how many available nodes right now on the system. So we just say this is a very simple command. It tells you how many allocated IDO and ADO usually means down and total. You can see Haswell and KNL. S control show job, a job ID is very useful for the jobs are currently still in the queue. So if you forgot what my job ID, what my, I'm doing, by using S control show job, my job ID, it tells you uh, which QoS is submitted, and when, I did, when did I submit, how many nodes, and especially from where I submit my job. What is my batch script? This is the most important feature, I think, because other um, fields, you can get it from SQ and SQS, et cetera. S account is querying the Slurm database, especially after your job has completed. Say, um, I can even do a, a S account my job um, in January, and I give you with what my which job I ran, how many nodes, what, whether my job stat state was, and I have a dash X. It's uh, more abbreviated. Without dash X, X it gives you more details of each S run command as well. With uh, with X, X, it gives you the batch job as a whole.
and talk about how your jobs are charged. The unit is NERSC hours. And, and Haswell and k &L has a charge factor per hour use is 90. And then based on your QoS, regular is one, premium charges twice, that gets you high to the, to the top of the queue quickly. And there's a low, gets you 25% discount, and flux gets you 75% discount. Low and flux are only available on k &L. Scavenger is zero, but you can't submit to Scavenger. It only goes to Scavenger when your repo is out of time. But priority is really low, and there's no, no charge. The shared, because you're sharing your node with each other, you're not charged for the per node. You're only charged for the fraction of the node. Again, uh, large jobs get 20% discount, 10,024 10, nodes or more on KNL. So here's an example. If you have you run on four has one nodes for one hour, it does not mean your wall clock requests the one hour. This one hour is actually wall time you drop start from start to finish. You may use only five minutes, then it will be charged only for five minutes. Then times QoS. So here example is four has one nodes times one hour times charge factor of 90 times premium Q QoS of two. So this job is going to be charged for 720 NERSC hours. If you have multiple repos, you specify dash A, your repo name, then each job will charge to your repo. Most users, if you have multiples, you already have a default. So if you don't specify, you'll get to your default. The queue policy, like I said, each QoS has maximum nodes, max time, limit, and charge factor, and priority-wise charge. So this you can find on the NERSC uh, webpage with the queue policy. This is just a screenshot of that as of today. It's uh, all subject to change. This is the Haswell policy, and this is the KNL policy. Some considerations where to run my jobs, Haswell versus KNL, depending on whether, say, Haswell have like big more things to consider. For me, whether I consider high throughput more important than charging whether it's worthwhile, you know, if I, I can, I, I'm willing to wait more for charge less or I want to be charged more for, you know, get my output faster. And whether your code is ready, optimized for KNL. So also we have less than 240 nodes on Haswell and over 9,000 nodes on KNL. So uh, currently, definitely KNL wait time is much, much shorter than Haswell. Plus, Addison just retired, so most Addison users convert. The first choice would be Haswell. But we had so many sessions training, we actually want to bring all of them all over and encourage them to run more on, on KNL and try to say your application needs to be optimized for KNL to consider you know, threat uh, optimization, vectorization optimization. So once your job is you know, more optimized on KNL, it will be more even worthwhile to run on KNL faster and, and Q short wait, uh, queue wait time. Other considerations are, um, what what what, Q, what QoS are available where and um, and discount etc to charge and remember to compile separately for your applications. If you just that putting the flag for KNL, it'll get you some speed up without by uh, compared to without doing that. Again, um, you know, the try to run variable jobs, flex QoS if you can, and large larger shorter jobs are easier to schedule than long smaller jobs. No, uh, am I? Yeah, <laughs> shorter jobs are easier to, to get backfill. There's some Q wait time statistics you can look at it, but it's just that the statistics in of the past. There are lots of documentations on docs.nurse.gov slash jobs. And if those things are not clear to you, um, send a ticket or call us to, we can um, help you further. I have. Yes. While your job is running, you can log in uh, so from to the to the computer, and, and can then. Can I also log in to from to notes of other people of my group? No. What I, what only I see only. Very often is that many people start jobs from a GUI, and then they have the option to select, for instance, the thousand CPU cores, then select it, and then in the end, um, the job is sorted, and it's not running efficiently. Um, because all the processes spend time just communicating, and yeah. You can log into your own uh, job seat, uh, yes, compute nodes, but not other users' compute nodes. 
any more questions? All right. Thank you.